everywhere you go in revival, somebody knows somebody who's been affected. There's somebody who's been changed. They won't shut their mouth up. They used to be a pervert. They're now saved. They used to be a drunk. They're now saved. And here's what happened in Northern Ireland. So many men got born again that were criminals. They actually closed the courts and a lot of the times and the jails. They actually closed them for a long period of time because there was nobody to fill them. Okay, so tonight's subject is, what is revival? What is revival? Um, let me just remind you here. Just um, I tweaked this definition a little bit because as, as I'm preparing for today, I'm looking at other men of God, just some of the, well, it's just more the second line here. I just added the second line in. But I read other men of God and they give a statement, so keep it fresh. I just want you to know what revival looks like. Um, Revival, it is a fresh inflow of the life, love, and power of God. Revival is when God dispels the darkness and deadness of spiritual declension. Revival is to rekindle the fire. Does that make sense? So I'm sure every one of us have went through seasons where we feel like there's just about a little flicker in the candle. Have you ever been through that? You feel like, it's not that you don't feel you're saved, but it feels like I've just about got a spiritual pulse. Um, I know I'm saved, but I don't feel like I have a really strong pulse. Have you ever been there? Uh, Have you ever been there where it's a a struggle to even open the Bible and read one chapter? Huh? Has anybody ever struggled with praying for five minutes? Like it just seems like, it's just so hard to just discipline, like... We could watch the TV for three hours, but to pray for five minutes, it's such an effort. You know, the reason for that is it's so easy to default to the flesh. It's just, it takes no effort. That's the way you'll go. If you just be yourself, you'll always default to what's not right. But to go the right way takes real effort. Like, okay, I'm going to make time for this. I'm going to make time for that. I'm going to make time for the house of God, the work of God. The call of God, whatever it is. Um, So, we've been looking at three types of revival. And tonight we're on the third one here. So we've looked at um, personal revival. Last week and the week before, we looked at revival of a group of believers. Us as a church. Tonight I want to look at national revival. What is national revival? So, my scripture text tonight, I want, maybe Ron, if you would... um, if you could help us tonight with this scripture text. So it's strange that all the passages we've looked at use the same word for revival. Hosea 14, 1 through 7. O Israel, return unto the Lord thy God, for thou hast fallen by thine iniquity. Take with you words and turn to the Lord. Say unto him, Take away all iniquity and receive us graciously. So will we render the calves of our lips and I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely for mine anger is turned away from him. They that dwell under his shadow shall return. They shall revive as the corn and grow as the vine. Okay. Who's God talking about here? Israel. So he's talking to the nation, would you agree? And what's the problem with Israel in this year? They're backslidden. They've gone back. There's compromises come in. Israel is in a mess. The the only wonderful thing about this is God didn't give up on them. Amen? Amen. And that to me is one of the things that I, one of the main things I enjoy about God is He doesn't give up on me. Because if you knew my battles, my struggles, my weaknesses, whatever, in the course of a week, a month, a year, you might give up on me. And I might give up on you. But God knows it all. And yet He doesn't give up on us. Isn't that tremendous? You know, that there alone, those grinds alone are grinds to waken you up from slumber. 
and cause you to worship Him in spirit and in truth tonight. Just to know that God doesn't give up on His children. But say that word backsliding um, stood out to me there. But also, um, He talks about returning. Do you see that near the bottom? They that dwell under a shadow shall return. They shall revive as the corn. And um, there's a few of you know what corn looks like in, in Nebraska. Nancy, you know what corn looks like? Everywhere you go, that gets a few months time. You look north, south, east, and west. So it talks about the reviving as the corn and grow up as the vine. So I want to use this just as a basis tonight of national revival. Um, Ron, could you help us with this? So I kind of, I try to in some way put into words what national revival is compared to personal revival or church revival. National revival is a notable, significant, and widespread change of the spiritual climate in the nation. It takes place when God sovereignly pours out His Spirit and impacts the culture, thinking, and behavior of society. It results in the gospel having an impact on what a nation accepts and how it functions. It is when the world looks up and takes notice of what God is doing and what the church is saying. There is a renewed interest and excitement in the things of God. There is an increased acknowledging of the true and living God of the Bible and his commands and demands in the public square. Okay. Would you agree there's a lot of people out there today will talk about God? Even in Congress today, would you agree? Like, you go to Congress, everybody believes in God. Wouldn't they say so? Would you agree that most people in Congress, in the White House, most people would say, yeah, I'm a Christian or I believe in God. Would you agree with that still? Or do you think that they say, oh, I have no time for God, don't believe the Bible? There's a lot of people profess God, but it's not the God of the Bible. Okay? But when revival comes to a nation, the God that's spoken about is the real God. It's not this phony God or dead duck God. The God that they speak about is a holy God, is a righteous God, is a just God. And one of the signs when there is a national revival is the politicians start looking over their shoulders at us, the church. They want, do you know why politicians do that? Be honest. Say revival was happening at the moment and it was widespread. Should I die, Curtis? Because maybe you're the hot commodity at the time, you know, so I want to, I want your vote, so I'm going to cater my message. But it, it's advantageous. It's not principles, would you agree? Most of the time, it's not because of principles. Like, oh, these, it, it's because Ron did it. What way is the wind blowing? Oh, we better align here or we're going to lose this election. Amen? Go ahead, Mary. Exactly. So uh, forgive me for being skeptical, but I can tell you I believe what God tells me. I believe he has no agenda with any of us. Um, his heart is genuinely 100%. And he doesn't tell us what we want to hear. What does he tell us? And honestly, let's be honest. What is it that we need to hear? We, we need the truth. Amen? So I'm telling you, when I want the truth, I go to God's word. And if I'm struggling to read God's word, I want to get under the word. I want to get to um, a church that's preaching the truth. I talked um, today to a young man, and he just tell me how he's looking for a church. And it's so hard, even in a big city, to get a good church. This is somebody who's out of state. And they said, we've tried this church, we've tried that church, we've tried this church, we thought we had a good church here, and then suddenly we realized this. But I'm telling you, it, we're living in a, a day where... Honestly, people are struggling to get somewhere where they feel they feel welcome. They feel they're going to hear the truth. They feel that they're going to enjoy fellowship. 
I'm telling you, there's a lot of people that are craving, craving just to find somewhere that they can call home. And I, I trust that as this church grows, that we will reach out to meet the need. And when God starts moving on the north, south, east, and west, I trust that we will be birthing churches in this nation. I feel we're in a period of preparation where God is building us up. Um, this, is, this is a time of preparation. Before any army goes to war, they have to prepare. We are in a season of preparation. I trust we'll be sent missionaries out. Um, you know, I'll not say it. It's okay. <laughs> There's a lot of things, in, oh, I better say it because you'll say, oh. okay. There's a lot of things, as I say, really encourage me. I talked to Bobby Joe the other day, okay? And I, but, you know, she's, she's obviously studying to be a doctor. What, one thing that has been on her heart from college is to be a missionary, a doctor missionary on the, the mission field. Well, do you know what? Somebody doesn't need to go to Africa to be on a mission field, amen? And her heart is to come closer to here. Brother, sister, we are, we are currently on one of the greatest mission fields in the world. This, this reservation, I mean, you could go to Africa and you're probably going to get more spiritual life in Africa and most places in Africa than you're going to find in this reservation. Do you agree with me? Everybody's looking at me as if I'm like saying something this way out. Huh? But it, what I'm saying is we are in a wonderful, I'm telling you, we are in a wonderful place to reach people who are broken, hurting, and need. Amen? And hey, I'm not just talking about Native Americans. I'm talking about whites, Hispanics, black, you name it. We're living in an area where people... They don't get it. They don't know the Lord. They're blind in their sin. And I'm telling you, we have the truth. And how dare us keep our mouths shut? We have the answer. We have the hope. We have the hope. Think about this. There's never been a greater hope in history than Jesus Christ. Would you agree? But I hope, and even through this series on revival, because I'm about to get into it a little bit, how revival will go from here outside the four walls, and touch people out there. Okay, so that's where we're going tonight. But please, I trust that you have a heart for people who are hurting, irrespective of color, creed, politics, whatever. I'm telling you, I want to see lives change. How about you? Or is it just the people who are in your social class you want to see saved? Huh? What about your own age group? Is that all you want to see saved? What about your own culture? Just your own culture? Do you understand? Jesus was, he, the Bible says about the Lord, he was no respecter of persons. Christine, what do you think that meant? He's no respecter of persons. It it didn't matter who you are, what you did, what you've done. And what you had. And what you had. It didn't matter. Like he, he's what he, he's what you needed and his hand was stretched out to you. He wasn't, he wasn't like like nitpicking this is my favorite over Mm -hmm. here and oh i only want to be seen with you or anything like that if you needed a savior he was there amen well guess what that's what we're supposed to be like do you think that when the pharisees come in he said oh pharisees come on you're going the front row here come on guys so good is that the way you think that's the way jesus was huh or all you roman centurions come on guys you're the men hey hey honestly no, but he wasn't taken by their status. You know, he, he, he went against all the normal religious rules. That's why they hated him. Remember when he talked to that woman of Samaria? Like she said, like, what are you doing talking to me? Like, like you know that I'm a, I'm a Samaritan and you're a Jew? Like, you guys don't talk to me. But he did. Not only that, but that was only the start of it. This woman had other problems. What was, I mean, how was things in her life? She had six failed marriages and now she's with number seven. But what does the Lord do? Like he's heading and he says, I must needs go to Samaria. There's a woman there that I want to meet. 
She's a broken woman. She's a needy woman. She's a rejected woman. But you know what? I love her. I want her and I'm going to get her. Isn't it lovely that he's like that? So the reason I'm saying that is sometimes we need reminded that's who we are. You know, it's not like, okay, if they support Iowa, I'm not, I, I, I hope they all go to hell. No, seriously, I mean, honestly, I, whether they're from Nebraska, Iowa, South Dakota, Ireland, we should have a heart for human beings. And here's a tester, by the way, and Curtis mentioned it tonight about Kathy. Do you think the Lord doesn't know whether you're prejudiced or not? Huh? Do you think the Lord knows that? Yes or no? If there's prejudice in your heart tonight, I guarantee you, He is not going to use you to reach that person there that you're prejudiced against. What do you think? He's going to use somebody that has got a heart of compassion because that's what he had. He had a heart of compassion for you. And I'm just telling you, examine your heart tonight. Is there prejudice in your heart against some people or whatever? Let me tell you, if you've got prejudice, you're a victim. Amen? Amen? You're a victim because you, what you're saying is they did this to me or they done that to me or whatever. No, I'm not a victim tonight. I'm a victor. Amen? So, but what I'm saying is you have to come over. You have to get over a lot of junk. Do you know what? There's people out there that are have a bitterness toward women. There's people out there have a bitterness toward men. Seriously? I'm telling you, you'll meet people and like, I don't trust any man. And whenever you talk to them, and sometimes the pastor in me wants to know, well, why do you say that? And then they start to open up their heart and it would break their heart how men have dealt with them for this last 30 years. But what I'm saying is rather than just like swat, 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 let them talk. Let people talk and find out where they're coming from and then minister Christ into them. I'm going to tell you about a man who will never hurt you. A man who will never let you down. A man who come to this earth for you to die for all of your sin. So you could be clean. He's irresistible, amen? But you understand, I'm not coming and say, well, light of the world's got all the answers. No. But Jesus Christ has got all the answers. And I want to talk about him. So we're talking about revival tonight, okay? Ron, would you help us here again? Revival starts with the revitalization of spiritual life of the church and results in the ingathering of lost souls to the kingdom of God. So just one thought. Remember what we established? You can only revive something that was once alive. Does that make sense? Okay, so the revival starts in the church, but the, the revival in the nation is the overflow of the church getting outside of the four walls and having an impact. The terms revival and awakening are generally synonymous. The larger the geography, a revival the larger the geography a revival covers, the greater the tendency to call it an awakening. Okay, whenever there's a national revival, a, a lot of down through history, and, and this is not I'm not making a theological point here. I'm just letting you know if you're reading books and whatever. If there's an incredible movement of the Holy Spirit in a nation, generally it's described in the history books as an awakening. Basically, the country awoke. And I'm going to have a few quotes tonight so you'll understand where I'm coming from. So I'm not saying, I can't argue that theologically. I'm not even trying to do that. But if you like reading history, I'm just saying, th these terms are synonymous, but you'll find they tend to use an awakening if it has a massive impact. Where, like from coast to coast, a country is affected. It's like, that's an awakening. So, again, I'm not making a theological point, And don't push me to go to a scripture to find that. I'm just letting you know the history books, how they describe it. Um, okay. So, I want to look at a scripture text that many of us know. Maybe many of us know word for word tonight. R Kyle, would you read this here? But before, before we read it, this is a revival passage. And I want you to like notice the promise 
heal my land or heal our land. Go ahead, Kyle. Second Chronicles 7.14, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Second Chronicles 7.15, Now mine eyes shall be open and mine ears attend unto the prayer that is made in this place. Second Chronicles 7.16, For now have I chosen and sanctified this house that my name may be there forever, and mine eyes and mine heart shall be there perpetually. Where does revival start? Revival starts with us. You know, one thing I'll say is, do you see if we start with blaming this and blaming that and blaming whatever, we're not getting what revival is. Okay, you can get up to the front tonight and give me an A to Z of the problems in America, and guess what? You could be right. Okay? But the reason why the country's messed up is why? The church is messed up. The buck always starts stops with us, okay? So God says the judgment starts with the house of God. I know we wanted to start in the White House, or we wanted to start in Congress, and Lord, sort out the politicians, and God said, no, I will need to sort my church out first, the apple of my eye. Those who, whose eyes are opened, their ears are opened, they know the truth. These other guys, they mainly don't know the truth. Curtis, does that make sense tonight? The, the, problem, the problem in our nation tonight is the church. The church has a pulse, but I don't think the church in America is in a really, really good place. How about you? Or am I being cynical? I mean, is the church in America in revival at the moment? Okay, so we're not being cynical. We're not being skeptical. In fact, what we're yearning for is a national revival. Amen? Tell me this, and I want you to be brutally honest tonight. Who believes there could still be a national revival in America? Put your hand up. Why? Why do you believe it? God's in control? Hope? What else, Steve? God's not dead. Amen? Like our family, and he's moving in here. We can see it, you know, a little bit. It's just this small, small slice. But even here, you can see it. And we've been through a lot of churches. And when you can see it, yeah. even just a little bit, you know that the Lord's moving. It's not, he's not over yet. Otherwise he wouldn't be gathering us here as we are. Amen. The, the old preacher said this, you know, when God's not finished with America, when he's still saving young people. Amen. I'm telling you, God is still on the move. So it's not, is God alive? Is God on the move? He is. He's moving. There's people in this church are in, are experiencing personal revival at the moment. There's people who are experiencing personal backsliddenness. There's people somewhere in between. We're all at different places at different times. We're all going through different things. Um, but I'm telling you, circumstances, politics, I'm saying whoever who is in the White House does not determine my happiness. Do you understand? Listen, I, before and after the election... I hope I'm in the victory before the election and I'm in the victory after the election because my faith is built on Jesus, the rock, the foundation of my life. You know, that, that house can rock at times, amen? Whose house over this last two years has rocked? I'm not talking about the thunder two weeks ago that was right up above my house. I'm t I've never seen a house shake and the window shake. As two weeks ago. So I'm not talking about your house shake and the gap, but whose life has been sh shook over this last two years? You just feel like, what's going on? Okay, but you know what? Your foundation was secure. What happens if you had built your house upon sand? You wouldn't be here tonight. I'm telling you something tonight. The fact that you're still alive tonight, the fact that you still are in the house of God tonight, tells me that your foundation is Jesus Christ. Because if it wasn't, 
Honestly, you wouldn't be here. You mightn't even be alive tonight. Amen? I mean, I think over this last few years, how many people have been protected in accidents? How many people have went through serious illness or sickness or surgery and are still with us? I mean, honestly, I think sometimes we need to take time out and remind ourselves how blessed we are. We are so blessed to God be the glory. Amen? So, this passage tonight is telling us this here is the blueprint for revival. Number one, humble ourselves. Brother, sister, I urge you, if there's anything in your heart tonight against a brother or a sister or against anybody, let it go. If you are... If you feel that you're better than anybody else, let that go. Repent of that. Seriously, like, I can tell you what, there's none of us. There's none of us have the authority to look down on anybody else. Let him who think he standeth take heed lest he fall. I'm telling you that that's why I've always said to you that whenever I die, don't even put Pastor Paul, just put Paul Malcolmson. In brackets, a sinner saved by grace. He was a stranger in a strange land. And then, dash, forgiven. Okay, that's the third thing that I want put on it. Forgiven. You imagine some guy walking his dog someday past the gravestone like, who's this weirdo? <laughs> huh? Seriously. In fact, period, and then forgiven, exclamation mark. Do you know what? Because who cares about our titles? You see, when you're gone, it's like, who cares? And by the way, you see my casket? Make sure the lid's closed, okay? I don't want you all gawking at me whenever I'm gone, okay? I don't want the rest of you looking and going, oh, isn't he looking so good? And like, you dirty stinking liar. You dirty stinking liars. I heard they were going to have you cremated. No. <laughs> no. No. Bro, I've told you to stay off these conspiracy sites, okay? <laughs> Seriously, isn't it good to be real in the house of the Lord? Huh? So, guys, we humble ourselves. Here's a, here's a kicker. We pray. A church that's in revival has to be praying. Okay? If you want to test the spiritual temperature of this church, come to the prayer meeting. I'm telling you, that's where we, you start to see who is starting to awaken, who's starting to get it. And I'm telling you, as you grow in the Lord, like Brother Clendenin always said, if the Holy Ghost moving in your life, He's going to bring you to a prayer meeting. Look at every revival in history. It's resulted from prayer and evangelistic preaching. Amen? Okay. Um, seek my face. Shelley, what, what, whenever you read something like seek my face, what do you think of? Just that phrase. Well, just get in the Word and see what He has for you. I mean, just because He speaks to us through it. Amen. To seek his face is just to seek him. So, you know, he's going to be revealed in his word. Um, if you're not in the word of God and you're not under the word of God, how are you going to know what he's got to say for you today? You know, a lot of it's like a no-brainer. Like a lot, a lot of growing in the Lord, a lot of revival is just the basics. Like, honestly, like, I, okay, I've heard this over the years. You know, once you get into your 50s and all, you lose your cutting edge, and then you start to you start to become judgmental, and you start to lose your fire. And, what, and I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. Who told you that? W where'd you get that in the Bible? Like, honestly, you, uh, Aaron mentioned Moses tonight. I'm like, I read men like Moses. I, I read people in Scripture, and I'm like, that's not biblical. You know, I, I trust that the heart that I have for the lost is... <laughs> Whoa, I thought, I thought the rapture had come, guys. <laughs> oh. oh, I thought it was the last trumpet. Wow. I talked to Will the other day about that thunder. And Will, Will and me were talking, we're like... Is this the end? Seriously, what was the thunder like your way? 
did it. Honestly, that was the worst I've ever. Like, it's like the whole. Was it like that in Decatur? Huh? Yeah. Well, I, okay. Well, let's let's move on from the trumpet. Okay. Um. Okay. To seek his face is to seek him. Okay. Number four. Turn from their wicked ways. And guys, we could do an A to Z here tonight of wicked ways, but you're you're different to me. What you struggle with. I mightn't struggle with and vice versa. So turn from your wicked ways is anything that is holding you back from him. And not just him, but I, okay, people try to divorce him from his house and from his work. Can you divorce God from his house and from his work? Be honest. Okay, so don't, I mean, the religious people say to me, oh, I don't need to go to church. You know, I have church every Sunday morning. Me and John Hagee are like this here. And I'm like, yeah, is he going to visit you whenever you're in hospital? Huh? Is he going to spend 10 minutes with you to encourage you when you're battling? You know, what I'm saying is that's not church. The word church is ecclesia, which means a gathering together. Okay? So it's not, it doesn't even fulfill the definition of church. Okay? This is church. This is fellowship, guys. Okay? So turn from your wicked ways can be anything that is holding you back from him, his house, his work, your, the call of God in your life your destiny in life, basically who you are and what you're meant to fulfill. Wicked, it can be anything. It can be, it can be a habit that's not innately sinful. But because you give so much time to that, it becomes sinful. It becomes an idol. So anyone, and by the way, and I say this to the young people, because with young people, they fall in love with somebody who's maybe not saved or whatever, I want to say to you, be careful about who you give your heart to and then that they don't become God in your life. That was whenever I fell in love with my wife, my feelings were so strong. I'm like, Lord, I don't want her to take the place of you. Do you understand? So that was something I was trying to remind myself. Lord, you are greater, better. Your love isn't up and down. You know, our love as human beings I don't care how strong your marriage is. Your love will be up and down at times. You'll have your moments. Amen? You'll have your bad hair days. You'll get out the wrong side of the bed. You'll, whatever, you, somebody will annoy your head and then you'll be hard to be around for a while. But, but he's not like that. He's completely different. So, what's the promise here? If we fulfill these four things, what will God do? Isn't that lovely? A, B, C. So, think about this. You know, the, he said he's going to hear from heaven. That tells you sometimes whenever we're in a backslidden state, he's not even listening to us. Hey, if we don't listen to him, there's times he doesn't listen to us. Now, what he does listen is a, a repentant cry. Okay? But if we're coming up with our religious selfish junk, it's like, No. No. He's not going to involve himself in that stuff. But whenever we humble ourselves, when we get right with him, his ears open to our cry. Also, he forgives our sin, which praise the Lord for that. But here's the kicker promise for this subject tonight. He's going to heal our land. So, anybody, any thoughts in this passage? Christine. Like the healing our land isn't just like dirt. Like it's very scary when the when when land is barren and you can't get any life from it because you won't be able to live. Um, but when he's talking about healing their land, he's talking about the hearts of men, like becoming alive. Yeah. And like yeah, because man, it, it's interesting because he uses like the natural, but it's really for a deeper a deeper meaning. And what he what God cares for is so is so deep, mm -hmm. and I I love that about him. You see. Honestly, th this gives us perspective because a lot of times we we can look around where we live. You can look around you, whether you live in a reservation, off the reservation, you live in the city, you live in a village. It doesn't matter. You, you can complain about who's in the village office or the, the council, whatever. But I'm telling you, in God's eyes, the problem's the church. If my people who are called by my name, okay, 
I'm, I'm trying to get you to think tonight, national revival comes from the church waking up and being the church. So if we want America healed tonight, where does it start? How does it start? It takes one here, one there. Before you know it, there's a move of God in, in a personal life. Then there's a move of God collectively. Then next month is, like we heard tonight, somebody like, you get to, um, Chance covered it. He's, he's talking to a friend. And before you know it, you can't keep your mouth shut. You have to share it because it's who you are. You know, we're not what we could be, but we're not what we used to be. Amen? So I, we're talking about how does it happen? It, once you see a move in here, you know there's hope for out there. But I'm not looking for a move out there to stir us. It, it, God stirs us. He exposes all the junk. He puts all the good stuff in. And before we know it, like it's like, okay, I can't keep my mouth shut anymore. I don't care if I lose my job. I'm, I'm going, my boss needs to know he's going to hell. or I, I, I need to know that he needs to be born again. Do you understand? You just get a touch of boldness. And I'm not saying you just go and do it. You need to be led by the Spirit. Okay? Some people you have to slap over the head. Others you need to be gentle with. The Holy Spirit will give you that wisdom. Amen. So, um, who was reading that? Kyle? Did we read 15 and 16? Okay. So now mine eyes shall be open. This is God talking. Once we get our act together... God's eyes will be open and his ears will be attent unto the prayer that is made in this place when we get our act together. So it's like he's not even looking at us. He's not even hearing us. It's like da 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 da. For now I have chosen and sanctified this house that my name may be there forever and mine eyes and mine heart shall be there perpetually. What does the word perpetually mean? So this, is, this was a promise to Israel, but this is a promise to God's people. Just because it was promised thousands of years ago doesn't mean that it's not applicable today. Uh, what you have to remember is that God's promises are eternal. So when God gives this promise to Israel, he's given it to us. Would you agree with that? Or was the old, is the Old Testament just completely done away with? That was for the Jews. This is New Testament's for us. How does that dynamic work? Can we take... Go ahead, Terry. Correct. So we're looking at a principle here of God. Like, if you, if you want to experience revival in your land, here it is. So I, I'm sure if you read all the history, this is the way God moves. And we need to be a praying people. We have to be a praying people. Go ahead, Ron. But it also is for the body. It's also for the individual. Yes, absolutely. So, in 1859, revival swept Northern Ireland. 100,000 people were saved in one year. Um, the population was under 1.5 million. Um, most of it happened in, in the Protestant community. So out of a million Protestants, 100,000 of them got born again. Um, the revival was mainly within the Presbyterian Church. But what was it like before that revival? I've got three quotes from three ministers before revival hit back in 1859. And Kyle, would you read these? This is the first minister. Hitherto, our condition was deplorable. The congregation seemed dead to God, formal, cold, prayerless, worldly, and stingy in religious things. Do you know what stingy is? Been tight? Yeah. What alarmed me most was the indisposition, almost hostility, of the people to meetings for prayer. They seemed mostly to think that they were well enough and that I was unnecessarily disturbing them. This is, this is the pastor talking, by the way. <laughs> I had never been so desponding or distressed as during the weeks immediately preceding the awakening. I had almost ceased to hope. I felt as if I was almost alone, no one mourning or praying with me, and I told my people I was appalled at their determination to have no prayer meetings. 
and that we would not have a drop of the shower of grace which was going round, but would be left utterly reprobate. Whoa. This is before revival. Here's two more. Two more pastors. There seemed great coldness and deadness. I had preached the gospel faithfully, earnestly, and plainly for 11 years. Yet it was not known to me that a single individual had been converted. Imagine that. Preaching for 11 years and there wasn't one convert. The congregation was in most unsatisfactory state. In fact, altogether Laodicean. What do you think, guys? These were three churches that God touched. God touched these churches and they, along with tens of thousands of people, the kingdom of God just absolutely took off. What happened was God decided enough's enough. And you'll find a national revival, it starts small, just like a little snowball at the top of a hill. And the ball just starts to roll. And what happens is it runs down the hill, that snowball. And before you know it, the devil can't stop it. It's so big, it's so powerful, it just sweeps everything in front of it. It sent, go ahead, Curtis. You compare that with, with what everybody says, you know, America is just so terrible and, uh, <laughs> you know, the Lord's got to be coming back. And, but at the same time, like, <laughs> what an amazing time to be in. Like, mm-hmm. if this is truly what these men were facing, and, and I would argue maybe this is what it's like now, mm-hmm. uh, what a great opportunity. Yep. Uh, what an amazing time to be a Christian, uh, especially in America. So I should say we should be very optimistic. Absolutely. And here's a thought, guys. I just heard recently, and uh, Hannah could uh, verify it, I think there's a lot of churches that are closing in this area at the moment. I think she said there's like 11 Catholic churches about to close in this area. Um, there's other denominations. What's happened is you may drive past a church building, but they just meet there once every four weeks. So the four congregations, they all meet together, Pender or here or whatever. What you're seeing is the demise of dead religion. That's what we're seeing. But also, where there is a pulse, where there is life, the churches are growing globally. You want to go, you say that there's no revival, go to some of the South American countries and say that. Countries that used to be 99% Roman Catholic are today 40% evangelical. That's happened like in our lifetime. That's happened literally in the past 30 to 40 years. So they may come to us and say, you guys are backslidden, but they're in revival. There's revival in this world at the moment. So don't just, sometimes we don't think outside of our own borders. But I'm telling you, there's revival in this world at the moment. God is always moving. And if we'll not move with him, that river will go somewhere. The river of life will go somewhere. God will, will where he has a people who want him, who want to do business with him, he will align with them. And Brother Clendenin's statement, which was a mantra every sermon, he used to say, God's just looking for an empty possibility. If you're empty, that means he can fill you. But if you're full of yourself, full of your own ways, your own ideas, your own opinions, he can't do anything with you. And that's why we have to empty ourselves as vessels, empty ourselves of our own feelings, our own opinions, our own agenda, and say, Lord, I surrender all. I, I, whatever you want. And I think that's something we, we're scared to do. Because once you say to God, whatever you want, guess what? He could take you anywhere. I made the mistake of doing that 30 years ago. Lord, whatever you want me to do, wherever you want me to go. And one of the first things he asked me to do was write a book on secret societies. Oh, thanks, Paul. Would you write a book? And nobody's written a book on these secret societies for 212 years. Would you write a book and expose this? And I remembered the vow that I made to God. And I'm like, yes, Lord. But I'm telling you, if you say that, you better believe it. I surrender all. All to Jesus, I surrender. We sing it, but do we mean it? But I'm telling you, when you do it, it is the most potent place on planet Earth to live is where your, 
you're like, Lord, I'm just a tool in your hand. Today, I find myself in Walt Hill, Nebraska, and it's like, what an honor. What a joy. What, you know, what I'm saying is, I think we're scared to say, Lord, whatever you want. Would you agree? It's kind of risky. Because in case he maybe wants to send you to Thailand or something like that. Or Taiwan or whatever. No, but seriously, whenever you are surrendered, submitted to his will, it's beautiful. But it is, it is. If you listen to stories of missionaries, it's, it's like, wow. Wow. So, um, okay. So, I want, I want to share this here because I mentioned this just briefly last week. But I want to develop it for a minute. When we think of national revival, we think of the majority of people get born again. That's what we think. Oh, the country came back to God, and like maybe we're we're conservative. We think maybe fifty percent of them got right with God. A lot of the times, it's just a minority that get it. Now, please hear me on this: that you look at the life of Christ and the ministry of Christ in Jerusalem. What? Do you think the majority of people in Jerusalem received him? Now think about it. He was their Messiah. He was the authentic, 100%, not just anointed of God, but supernaturally walking on water, changing water into wine, raising dead men out of the grave. Did the whole nation go, yay? What did they do to him? I'm tell- we, so I want to look at something that Jesus said and then something that Paul said. And remember this, Paul saw a revival throughout Europe. Hundreds of thousands came to Jesus. But that didn't mean the majority did. So let's just look at a couple of statements here. Ron, would you read these? And this was a statement Jesus made in the midst of revival. Jesus said in the midst of revival in Matthew twenty two fourteen, For many are called, but few are chosen. Okay, so this is in revival, he says, saying this. So would you agree there was many people heard the voice of Jesus? But there was a few that heard him. Okay, and this is why he said, you've got ears to hear, but you don't hear. You've got eyes to see, but you don't see. You don't even know who's in your midst. So I'm just telling you, when revival comes, the majority mightn't get it, but it's still revival. Okay? Go ahead, bro. Paul the Apostle said in the midst of revival in Romans 11.5, Even so then, at this present time also, (coughs) there is a remnant according to the election of grace. Okay. So... When we start to share the truth, there's a remnant out there that have got ears to hear and eyes to see. All you have to do is open your mouth and preach the truth to every creature and trust God that He will do what we can't do. Does that make sense? Because the alternative is that you have you start to manipulate and scheme and think that you have the possibility to change the human heart. How, how easy is it to change the human heart? Okay, so that's where pride kicks in when we think we have the ability. But when we say, Lord, unless you do it, it's not going to happen. That's where we're in the place. But I'm saying what to expect in revival is a mighty move of God. But that doesn't mean that everybody gets it. But I want to say this. Even though the majority mightn't get it, maybe the majority will. I'm not saying they won't. But what does happen is, that it has an effect upon the culture. Which is a big change where even though these, say, let's just use 10%, find the Lord. The other 90% know all about it. There's somebody in their workplaces on fire for God. There's somebody in their family. Maybe there's a whole family in the family that have got wonderfully born again. They can't run away from it. Everywhere you go in revival, somebody knows somebody who's been affected. There's somebody who's been changed. They won't shut their mouth up. They used to be a a pervert. They're now saved. They used to be a drunk. They're now saved. They used to be the biggest rascal in town. They used to be a thief. And here's what happened in Northern Ireland. So many men got born again that were criminals. 
they actually closed the court, the courts and a lot of the times, and the, the jails, they actually closed them for a long period of time because there was nobody to fill them. In Wales, what happened was the police stations had nothing to do. And do you know what they did? They turned their police station, the, the policemen become, turned themselves into choirs. And on Sunday nights, the police officers would go with the different um, churches on Sunday night that were having revival meetings, and they would sing. The Welsh, the Welsh male voice choirs are the best in the world. But what I'm saying is, the other thing was, the bar owners would get wonderfully born again. So the bars were closed. There's another, there's another thing against alcohol, that every revival, there's always a closing of the bars. Okay? So... It changes society because everybody knows God is on the move. Nobody needs to tell them God's on the move. They see Jimmy every day. Jimmy, who was a town alcoholic, and he's wonderfully born again. So what I'm saying is they can't get away from it. And like we mentioned, the politicians, they're looking over their shoulder now. Wow, if I bring this law into place, I could be in trouble here. Because... I'm not going to get the votes. If I lose a percentage of my votes, not just the 10%, but what happens is the 10% are like salt and light. So what does salt do? We're the salt of the earth. It's, it's a preservative, but it, well, it stems putrefaction. It brings taste. It gives something a bit of taste. So the country becomes tasty again. Amen. We, br- we bring a taste to this nation. But also we bring light. So it's not just you, but your family start to vote differently. So your, your, your family was voting this way, now they're voting that way. Even though maybe they're not all born again. Does that make sense? So you have the, you have the spread of the influence like leaven. And that leaven is everywhere. And it's like, who's going to get saved next? So I want to encourage you on that there tonight that we don't need to set how many people. We know there's a remnant out there. Amen? Let's wait to eternity to realize who, what, why, when, where. Go ahead, Christine. And and then Cameron, did you have your hand up? Okay, Christine. Um, Question. Um, So you know how like this whole transgender pronoun thing has just gone across the country like wildfire? Mm -hmm. But when the Lord, like, lights up his his the people mm-hmm. isn't that greater so like you see a glimpse of what something evil looks like spreading mm-hmm. but then when with what god does it's it's greater and more impactful is it and it's not just a trend right correct like there's a it keeps in a, like a good effect but it, but that's a really good example because what we're looking at at the moment is a spirit society just doesn't when, when i was at school society doesn't change from that to that without it being controlled by a spirit. Okay? Throughout the world at the moment, there is a spirit of Antichrist. Antichrist is everything God says is wrong, they say is right. Everything that God says is right, they say is wrong. So it's a spirit at work. So what we're seeing is, is a spirit that has come in, and God said that it would come in. But also there's promises when the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against it. So it's never, it's never like, oh, we're poor church. There's no hope for us. I mean, it's, uh, let's just all hunker down. And um, what's the old song? He used to say, hold the fort for he is coming. And it was so depressing. Like, you know, let's play defense, guys. You know, let's, let's all get in, into our basements like, and just fill it up with food and just hope that nobody kills us. No, we're, we're a militant army. We're an army that's on the front foot. Amen? Amen? No, seriously, like we, like so what if if we die tonight? Say this country is nuked right now, we're all right into the presence of Jesus like that. Do you, do you know what I mean? So we, we have to realize that we we're different. We are different. You know, we God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind. Amen. So what what we're looking at tonight is revival. I want to give a couple more quotes and then we'll finish. Um, okay, uh, Kyle, would you read this? Jonathan Edwards and Charles Finney. Jonathan Edwards, who preached with George Whitfield, wrote in his thoughts on the revival in New England. 
who that saw the state of things in New England a few years ago, the state that it was settled in, and the way that we had been so long going in, who would have thought that in so short a time there would be such change? And again, how dead a time it was everywhere before this work began. Mm -hmm. Charles Finney, the, the prevalence of wickedness is not evidence at all that there is not, not going to be a revival. That is often God's time to work. Mr. Finney noted this all through those times of revival. Okay. Do you believe that tonight? Sometimes it just has to get to a certain low where the devil thinks it's over, where the church are even struggling to have faith, and God says, it's my time to move. Um, this is what they said um, with John Wesley and George Whitfield in England. Okay, They wouldn't let them preach in the churches. Okay, So where did they preach? Preached in the graveyards. They would have 35,000 people so they wouldn't let them into the dead duck church. They barred them from it. So they said, we're going to meet at this church. We're going to have our service in the graveyard. 35,000 people would turn up. 40,000, 50,000, 20,000, everywhere they went. So what they did is they knew the times at the mines, when the miners would come out. So they, would tell, they knew that the shift would change at this time. Where did they preach? They, right at the entrance to the mines. So the thousands of guys would come pouring out at 3 o'clock and the guys would have their pulpit and they would preach for hours. And so many men got born again. They said their black faces, they called them trail, train tracks. They're just the white, they had the white stripe down them. They looked around the audience, hard miners. And there you had the train tracks all around as they're preaching the gospel. Just revival was sweeping the nation. And there's nothing the devil could do about it. They wouldn't let them in the pulpits. And? So they just, the, their pulpits were trees. Their pulpits were wherever they could lay their hat. That's where they, they would just, they're not going to let us in there? Well, we're going to have church. But I'm telling you, God moved. That, so this is what they said about Wesley and Whitfield. Wesley and Whitfield came to England when the devil was alive and the church was dead. I'm telling you, God could move. It could be tonight. It could be Sunday. It could be in a week's time. We should always be expectant because of the, we know who our God is. So just whenever people say it's hopeless, just whenever they say America's gone, just whenever, that's the time that God says, really? Really? Do you know who I am? Do you really know who I am? Like, I'm the one who calls the shots here. And here's my finishing thought on National Revival here tonight. A lot of the time God moves in the most unsuspecting of places. We think it is going to come through this great preacher. Or God's going to start it by this famous man of God. A lot of the times God just moves where he decides to move. Somewhere where you say, no, God couldn't move there. He is. And so I'm telling you, if you want revival, if you're expecting revival, try and give God a blank sheet. Just say, Lord, I'm not, my opinions don't even matter here. I just want to see revival. I want you to use me. I want you to use this church. But do you know what? It could be some of our young kids here are the ones that's going to lead us into revival. Revival could break out in the tweenies. Revival could wake break, it could break out some of these young men in this church. Who knows? It could be some of the older men. It could be Ron reading, leading us into revival. It could be Roland. I'm telling you, don't underestimate our God. Amen? If God could use Moses at 80 to lead a whole nation and deliver that nation from Pharaoh, he can use any of us tonight. Just don't say, Lord, it couldn't be me. And a preacher actually rebuked me whenever I was young, whenever um, somebody said, oh, you could be a Spurgeon, whatever. And I'm like, I laughed and I said, no way. He says, don't say that. By your words, you're justified. By your words, you're condemned. You know, according to your faith, God could use you tonight in your town. God could use you in your home. I'm telling you, revival could break out in your home tonight. And that revival could come in here on Sunday morning. And I'm telling you what, Church could just take on a different form. And all the, the, 
anyone in here who's religious, they're probably going to leave. If there's any form of religiosity or prejudice, whatever, oh, well, God can't do that. Really? He is. Let's pray. I don't know about you, whenever I get onto this subject of revival, I, it, it fires me up. It fires me up because, not because we have it together, but He has it together. And I'm telling you tonight that God is alive. He wants to quicken us tonight. He wants to shake us out of our apathy, wants to take us to a level where He can actually use us. Just to ask Him tonight, just in your own private and personal way, just ask Him to use you. Ask Him just in whatever way He wants to use you for His glory and just for the, the betterment of this generation. If there's anything in your life you feel that is, we talked about a wicked ways to, to, to abandon our wicked ways. If there's anything in your heart, anything wicked, just ask God to forgive you tonight for that. Listen, we all have stuff that comes in between us and God. Just God can expose it right now. Just ask Him to forgive you, cleanse you, use you, just as an instrument in His hand to reach this generation. I can tell you, it's not going to be long until we're out of here, whether it's through death or whether it's through His appearing. But we're, we're going to see Him soon. But we want to see Him to hear that well done and my good and faithful servant. We're not a legalistic church. We're not saved by works. But God's people have a heart to serve. Amen? Father, tonight, Lord, we come before you in awe of who you are. You are the God of revival. Lord, you are the same God as was happening back in the Old Testament. You're the same God of the New Testament. You're the same God of 1859. You're the same God of Wesley's day and, and Spurgeon's day, Whitfield's day. Lord, all these great men of God. Lord, and even tonight, you're moving in this world. Lord, you're moving by your supernatural power. You're changing hearts tonight. You're changing churches tonight. You're changing nations tonight. There's whole nations, O oh God, that are turning. Lord, in South America, in the way of God. And Lord, I pray that in wrath, remember mercy. Lord, do not overlook this great nation, O oh God. I pray that you would waken the church up, that the church would stand up, and that the, the nation would waken up because the church has awoken out of her slumber. Lord, I pray that we would be part of the answer. Lord, let your spirit, your fire fall upon us tonight. Lord, you have got quality people on every row of this church. Lord, you've servants in every row of this church tonight. Lord, I pray that we would be active and doing what you want us to do. Lord, just show us what you want us to do. Lord, would you put square pegs into square holes and round pegs into round holes, Lord. Lord, that we wouldn't just want to force it or manipulate it. Lord, that we every aspect of this church would function, Lord, like a well-oiled machine. And Lord, that we would indeed, Lord, experience a supernatural move of your spirit, that healings would come back, salvation would come back, marriages would be restored, O oh God. Lord, that miracles would be happening on the left and the right. Lord, just I pray for this reservation afresh, that you would move on this reservation. Lord, nothing is too difficult for you. Lord, that you would move on the right hand and on the left hand, that you would give us a heart for whoever you want us to speak to. And Lord, that we would just see a stirring, a stirring. Lord, let the fire even lighten our hearts tonight, that Lord, we will not be the same again, because that fire was kindled. Lord, the flames were fanned tonight, because you were here, and Lord, you spoke. Lord, we just thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Amen.